UNFTR. Hey, on fuckers, welcome back to UNFTR. So we have an interesting one today because much of the work that my guest has done over the years, not available. Why? Totally censored. It's a really, really interesting, fascinating story that I can't wait to dig into. Because like many of us who've become politically sentient, I'll say, over the past 20 or 30 years, there's been a shift. And for me, that shift, I think like a lot of people, was during the war on terror years, it became very difficult to discern fact from fiction. And so the anger post 9-11 was replaced on one hand by this um, disillusionment. And on the other hand, it was replaced by virulent hatred. And this split personality that America has has sort of manifested in a strange way because we'll commit atrocities throughout the world and support atrocities and do terrible things to our own people. And yet somehow maintain this illusion in our minds that we're the good guys. So one of the gateway drugs for leftists, I feel, is our guest today, who was really important in my political coming of age. Uh, I watched his stuff in every format and every forum that you could possibly do, uh, that you could possibly consume it, um, and sort of became hooked. And to set up uh, the interview today, I wanted to read one of my favorite quotes about our guest. It's from investigative journalist Greg Palast, who said, Lee Camp has found the hole in America's brain where reason has been replaced by Walmart. Lee's rants channeled the gunk oozing out. I love that. And so let's talk about some moments of clarity. And it's my great, great pleasure to welcome uh, the great Lee Camp to the show. Thank you. I'd forgotten about that quote. Appreciate it. It's a good one. And Palast is one of the greats. So uh, that's that's great praise. How you doing? I'm, I'm hanging in here in this bizarre <laughs> metaverse we're in. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I don't know. Like anytime something positive happens, I'm like, well, at least I'm not the other 99% of the population. And every time something negative happens, I'm like, well, that's where we are. <laughs> I want to talk to you about Moment of Clarity. First to pay you an, a compliment before we get in but then to ask you kind of like how that all started. So for those that don't know about Moment of Clarity, and, and I think actually it's even fuzzy in my brain because I don't even remember where I first started consuming it because it's listed as a web series, right? But I feel like I saw it through Facebook because that's what old people know and do. <laughs> I think um, I watched it first on Friendster. Right? <laughs> yeah. But Moment of Clarity was this really grainy, uh, very short take video series that I think was one of the first viral sensations that I can remember about political commentary. Can you can you just bring me back to that moment and describe how that all started and, and the traction that you got? And was that kind of the thing that kicked you off? Yeah, uh, thanks, man, for, for even remembering. It's amazing how short the... Um memory span is nowadays but uh yeah i so i i've been a stand-up comedian or i you know not professionally but i started at 17 became full-time at by 22 so i guess i started with stand-up comedy and then i spent many years uh performing stand-up just every night of the week and I, you know, obviously everyone began talking about uh, MySpace, which then segued into Facebook and then YouTube. And and so I started putting some things up on YouTube. Uh, I had a, a part time job writing some comedy for Huffington Post at the time. And um, I just decided, you know, I'm going to start doing these basically five minute uh, straight to camera political commentary with comedy. Uh, so it, I guess it is political comedy, comedy. And I just started doing those. And of course, when you start something like that, uh, especially back then, but even now, you're going to have, you know, 10 viewers and then you're lucky 20 viewers or something, you know, crap. And I just decided I'd do it like an exercise. Like, I'm just going to use this as this is a writing practice. Uh, I'll get better at writing my comedy. I'll get better at performing and I'll just use it as practice. And and so I don't remember how long it took till that first one really uh, hit off. 
Uh, I remember the first one that I think got 50,000 views, which was, you know, way more than normal, was the one uh, discussing the only trial ever held on the assassination of MLK Jr. Uh, was actually in 1999. And there was even a tiny little article in the New York Times where they pretended it didn't matter because that trial found that James Earl Ray had not killed MLK Jr., but it was a government conspiracy. Anyway, yeah, they they grew bigger and bigger till the till uh, you know they never got massive, but they grew big enough that uh, people started to know me for them. Abby Martin brought me on her show regularly on RT America, and then when RT America wanted to create a comedy show, their first and only and ever comedy show, um, I think I might have been the only comedian that they knew of doing <laughs> doing that kind of political comedy. And they basically said, can you come create a show? And there were never any restrictions. They never told me I had to say anything or couldn't say anything. And and so, and I knew, here's the thing. I had a lot of correspondence, probably uh, eight or something over the eight years that I was there. Some would come for a year and then leave. And so they'd be a part of the show, but most would leave eventually. And I knew, even while I was there, that this would that this had never existed before a comedy show weekly comedy show where I get to write whatever I want I get to go after the U.S. Empire I get to go after corporations I get to go after all those people those corporations that would advertise on other networks I just knew it had never existed before it would never exist again probably and so I was like this is a, a fucking unicorn that this even <laughs> that this is even possible. And sure enough, then, you know, you get eight years in and the uh, I mean, they started heavily suppressing everything we did by 2016. But, you know, two years ago or two and a half now, they uh, they the U.S. sanctions just uh, shut down the entire network and banned everything from YouTube, banned my Spotify, et cetera. Um, before we move on, and I actually want to share uh, kind of a core memory with you um, before we move on. I just want to make sure that we too don't just gloss over that moment where you talked about the MLK trial. So if you could just run that back just really quickly, because it's amazing how you can mention that to people and they're like, what? Like it's still <laughs> yeah. not a thing that people know and talk about. So if you could just really run, rewind that for one second it's, and just say that part again. That'd yeah. Be great. That, well, that was my thought when I first heard about it, I was like, wait, what? <laughs> uh, and at that time in my life, I believed that James O'Reilly had killed MLK Jr. I also believed that Lee Harvey Oswald had killed JFK, um, et cetera, et cetera. But I, I was like, wait, the only trial ever held? Uh, and there's a great there's a great book. It's multiple editions uh, written by William Pepper. He died recently, but uh, he was King's lawyer. He, he ultimately represented the King family in that lawsuit that uh, came to trial in 1999. The King family uh, brought the lawsuit to basically clear James Earl Ray and say that this was a government conspiracy, uh, along with the only person named was Lloyd Jowers, who owned the bar and grill from basically the back area of which is where the bullet came from. Um, and he was part of the plot. He didn't fire the gun. He disposed of the gun, but he was part of the plot. And he was like 99 when they did this trial and and uh, had nothing to lose by coming forward and telling the truth. But he, he, he I mean, nothing to gain. And he did it anyway. Um, but yeah, it's it's there was never any trial. James O'Ray, the only time he ever said he was the one who killed MLK was one time he confessed after being harangued for days and days and days in police custody and his lawyer who was basically working for the state said the only way you'll get a trial to clear your name is if you confess and so he signed this confession thinking he'd finally get a trial he just did not get a trial <laughs> and immediately <laughs> once he realized that he'd been had he he said he was not the one who did it and he stuck with that to, for the rest of his life. And the King family met with him before he died and uh, shook his hand and said, you know, we're sorry this got pinned on you. Um, and, you know, most people don't know any of this. I mean, no. it's it's amazing. No. And still don't know any of this. I, I mean, anyway, uh, so core memory that I wanted to share. So I had gone down to do uh, Abby's show and then met you afterwards and, and, uh, the group from RT was going to go catch your set later that night. And I was like, oh, well, I'm in town. I have nothing to do. That's amazing. And so uh, I trailed along with everybody. We went down. And what I found amazing 
about your stand-up. And I promise the compliment train is going to stop and we'll dig into shit and maybe we'll disagree. I'm trying to, I, did, I didn't perform that many sets in DC, so you must have caught a rarity. Uh, it was Well, and I think that's why everybody was like, dude, we got to go. We got to go because Lee's going to do a set tonight. And you did a set. And what was amazing about it is you you were able to just shut off the the political side. There was political humor in it, but you did a fucking awesome set and laid this place out where you had not it wasn't just like people following you there it was like a group of it was pretty it was a pretty mixed and diverse group mm -hmm. but your yeah. comedy was just so searing and so good that i remember thinking oh this guy is a fucking pro <laughs> but it it's interesting to me and and maybe we'll get into a little bit of this now to talk about the media culture and then i want to get into a few current events because you've had some really great takes on them lately when we think about the media culture, the, this idea that comics, trained comics, the ones that have really become practiced at the art of comedy, you know, which, which you had, I mean, you lived in this discipline for so many years, have become really important to, to politics where they used to be, maybe, maybe they were um, adjacent to it. You had uh, maybe a Lenny Bruce could represent a certain segment of the population and be really biting and acerbic and put the mirror on America. Um, and, and then be chased to his death for doing it. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. it's, it's, yeah. it is a dangerous game. It really is. Um, and then you've got sort of the milquetoast versions that, that have come across the years. You've got some satire that now doesn't even feel like satire because the world is so satirical but it's you've been in the game now for a long time. How do you sort of interpret the evolution of comedy as the truth telling mechanism through the media landscape from where you started to kind of where it is today, where it, it's it's really difficult to to actually kind of pull the two apart? Yeah, I mean that is weird that the, that comedians have become uh, in in many topics in many areas the the truth tellers that are willing to go beyond the Overton window, uh, and I think I, you know I was trying to figure out exactly why that is because many of the ones I'm thinking of are not they're not like uh, you know real fire and brimstone political comics they're just. Um, you know, willing to question the 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 propaganda we're sold by our mainstream media a little more than your average. And I guess part of it is that if you go into comedy and then if you stay in comedy as a stand up comic, first of all, you're kind of a loner, but also it's kind of an anti authoritarian sport. I mean, you're you're w without a group. You're up there on stage. You're speaking your mind. You feel a need to speak your mind. And for the most part, there aren't really guardrails. Like you're not trying to work your way up a corporate ladder at CNN or something, which if you are, you will either do the corporate line or those people who don't will slowly get weeded out and they'll never be seen on television much because they get weeded out pretty early. Um, now, I will say that you get edgy enough in terms of political speaking and the guardrails of comedy then become apparent. Uh, but in a large way, comedians are able to go into these unique directions. Uh, you know, Joe Rogan and, uh, Katie Halper, uh, you, you know, to speak some current ones, uh, even some of Doug Stanhope's older political stuff. He's not as political now, but is, is incredibly edgy and uh, questioning things in a, in a brilliant way. If you go back to like his 2010 stuff, um, but, uh, and then you have people that are not really considered political comedians, yet they're the ones willing to ask certain questions like uh, Hannibal Burris revealing the Bill Cosby rape allegations on stage. And that became a viral clip that ultimately got Bill Cosby put in prison. He's mm -hmm. since been released, but still uh, pretty, pretty powerful stuff. Uh, and I, I think that does have to do with the fact that we don't, Stand-up comics don't work up a corporate ladder the way that a, a media personality or something would. But in terms of where those guardrails ultimately become apparent is if you're going to have a, a mainstream TV show, if you're going to be a Stewart or Colbert or something, you are going to most of the time not go at 
the U.S. empire writ large. You can, as Chris Hedges put it, you can make fun of the foibles of the leader. You can call uh, leaders, you can call Biden uh, inept and he has dementia and look at him fall down and things like that. You can call Trump an orange face moron and all that, but you can't go at the heart of the system, at least not regularly. You can't go at capitalism. You can't go at, at, at corporate rule. Uh, and if you do that, then you become like me, where... Comedy Central, I was on one Comedy Central clip in my entire career uh, when I was younger, but they basically knew that, and even and this is even while they're looking for political comedians for Daily Show and stuff like that, they didn't really want anything to do with me. Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of people don't see the difference between like what I do and what Jon Stewart does. And I think Jon Stewart's a very talented comedian, but he's largely not going at the heart of the system. And that's what allows him to have a a massive, massive platform on mainstream media. Same with Colbert and Bill Maher and all these people. What do you, what are you, what do you consider yourself? Like, so when you're meeting people for the first time out in the wild and they say, Hey, what do you do? What, like, how do you, like, how do you see yourself in the world? Are you a comedian first? I've, I've, uh, I've had more and more trouble answering that question. Like the past few years, like, uh, you know, for a while I could just say TV host and leave it vague. Yeah. Um, and then if they ask, say comedy TV host, but the, you know, when I was doing redacted tonight, most of what I do was doing was, uh, fully comedic commentary. Whereas now I do live streams, you know, four or five days a week at, uh, you know, rumble.com slash Lee camp. But most of it is not comedy. I'll throw in some lines here and there. So when people ask what I do, I'm like, comedian commentator i guess <laughs> i don't even know what it is that's how i feel about media as a whole right now yeah. it's like i don't know because when you think about social media it's it's as much media as it is social and i and i think a lot of that has has really sort of mixed together it, it in a, in a really toxic mix, mixture also but it's mixed together in a way that we no longer can discern from these things um when we think about the establishment media what's interesting to me is how the voices online can be so pronounced like we can follow you can follow you you have a massive following with when you put together your social media following your podcast following your youtube subscriber you put that together let's say you speak or can speak regularly to half a million people just like that you know, you turn it on, you say, okay, these are the channels I'm going to go through. This is the message that I want to get out there. And 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 whether it's directly or being amplified by people that share your stuff, maybe you can reach half a million, a million people at a clip. And that feels like an earthquake. It feels like it should be an earthquake. And yet the mainstream media, their numbers are so pitiful. When you look at Nielsen ratings or box top ratings or what people are saying that are, you know, that how many people actually sit down to consume it and know it's just the 65, 70 plus demographic now and the stuff that, but the, the, the stuff that seems to make it into the cultural milieu is still coming from the establishment media. Mm -hmm. Well, so why do you think it is that on this ecosystem that feels so seismic on YouTube or rumble or on all of these other outlets, does it not still pervade mainstream consciousness i'm not talking mainstream media like mainstream consciousness and the culture well they got very nervous that it was uh and i i legit have not heard anyone else describe this this way but i think it's one of the most pivotal things that's happened in our lifetimes there was a window there was a brief window of time when internet and and uh, videos particularly online had become prevalent and everyone had them and everyone could get them on their phones and watch a video. It didn't take four hours to download a video on a phone. And that time started in like, you know, 2008, maybe 2006, if you want to exaggerate a little. Um, And it really ended in, at least for, for many of us, for much of the stuff they wanted to suppress, it ended around 2016. Uh, Bernie Sanders got so close to winning the Democratic primary, despite all the rigging, despite everything, super delegates and uh, <clears throat> and and you know lines for the voting machines and that that were carefully orchestrated and placebo provisional ballots, as your your buddy Greg Palace calls them, placebo ballots. And 
they got so close. He got so close to winning. And, and I think it was that. It was the rise of Donald Trump, which is kind of populist on the right, as Bernie is populist on the left. Um, it's also Occupy. It's the Black Lives Matter nearly getting out of control or real, wh what they would call out of control, what I'd call uh, radical uprising. And all these things happen within that within that window. And after 2016, they shut down a large part of it. Um, you know, I can speak. I'm not saying it only happened to me. I just know my numbers and my analytics. And I watched my Facebook, which was gaining 5,000 uh, new followers a week, become essentially frozen. I mean, it's been at th around 330,000 followers ever since then, ever since 2016. If I gain, if a post does well and I gain some, they'll unsubscribe people to get it back to where it was. So it's just gotten stuck there. And my posts are rarely ever seen by more than 0.1% of my followers. Same on Twitter, YouTube, obviously. I had the 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 grand digital book burning that happened to me in, uh, in two years ago. But even before that, it's just crazy suppression on, on all of these things. And every time I start to uh, build something up, a video or a post does very well, then the following week, it'll all crash back down, basically getting me back to not being able to reach hardly anyone. And, you know, that's hmm. just me personally, but this is this was done across all social media spectrums. I mean, we know from the Twitter files how aggressive the uh, CIA and the government have been at suppressing, deleting, banning accounts across these platforms. And um, and and then you have the example of TikTok. TikTok was outside of these, uh, you know, this careful cage they have orchestrated for um for reach across social media. And that's why TikTok was, was forced and is in the process of selling to Goldman Sachs, essentially to Mnuchin. Um, and it's because it was outside of that, of that cage they've put on to these platforms, which are now part and parcel to the U S corporate structure. I mean, we, we live in inverted totalitarianism ruled by the anonymous corporate state. So it's like, it's not exactly that the government regulates Facebook. It's that Facebook and meta and, um, you know, to, to a little degree, Twitter even are are part and parcel of the U.S. corporate structure, the corporate governance. I appreciate you bringing Sheldon Wolin in so I don't feel as alone on this channel. <laughs> so thank you for that. Um, this is uh, we had a discussion with Giannis Varoufakis a couple of weeks ago about his uh, his theory of techno feudalism. And a lot of what you're mm -hmm. saying is, I think, mirrors that in the in the discipline of still manufacturing consent, but also then doing it through the auspices of owning the technology, owning the data, the information, and the dissemination of it. Um, and this is the real world that, that this is what we get. And, you know, and I've often said that, like, what the, this is what you get is not the same thing as this is what you deserve. We don't deserve this um, just in the same way that uh, that's, that's how we sort of characterize the war in Gaza, um, you know, that October 7th this is what you get is not the same thing as this is what you deserve. Nobody innocent deserves to be slaughtered, but this is what you get when you create a system and a structure that oppresses people for quite literally decades where death, hunger, starvation, or resistance is the only option. So these are the logical outcroppings of those type of systems. And, and in the, the techno uh, go ahead. Re respect existence or expect resistance. There you go. So in this techno feudalism sense, I can also see how quickly, and I'm glad you pinpointed 2016, that I don't think the book has been written or enough people, again, in the mainstream culture, appreciate what the establishment had to do. They had to bring the house to, to derail the Bernie movement. They had to bring it. They left nothing in reserve literally nothing in reserve. They yeah. had to pull out all the stops to derail what was a freight train and one of the most exciting political moments, certainly in my lifetime. Um, but and, it and shows anybody, you how coordinated think, it can be. I, and I think it woke a lot of people up. I had someone just mention it again to me, like as their political awakening, watching Bernie get uh, destroyed during that primary by all of these rigged forces and anyone could just use their eyeballs and see Bernie Sanders has a, a, a rally at uh, whatever it was, you know, in, in New York city with a hundred thousand people clogging the streets. And then there's a video of Hillary Clinton in a high school gymnasium where the seats are half empty. And you go, 
I think he's probably winning this. And <laughs> it's the amount of rigging they had to yeah. do to to make that uh, look as if she won something was just amazing. Yeah. So let's get into some current events because uh, you had you've had. I follow you, so the, there's a lot of good stuff there. But you had two really great takes recently. Um, one of them was talking about political violence. So the big story, obviously, is Donald Trump gets clipped in the ear by a very young, very confused Republican who seems to just who seem to be Googling who's going to be the closest politician to me, I think is the reporting that's been coming out. And turns out it was Trump and he wanted to make a name for himself. Who the fuck knows? Um, but yeah. the bottom line is uh, almost immediately, one of the things that I think we've all, at least in, in, in what we do for a living, become attuned to is start listening for the sameness. So what are, what are the, what are the statements when the statements begin to sound the same coming from this person and that person, and then the right and the left, and they sort of coalesce around an idea, a statement, and a framework, it happens very, very quickly. And the framework of this particular event was we all have to condemn political violence. And so I think by the ninth time I'd heard that <laughs> phrase, I was like, okay, so this is the message we're going with, and that's fine. And also, it's not wrong. And also, maybe I should invite Lee Camp on and just let him fucking cook for a minute. So I'm just going <laughs> to tee that up and just hand it over to you and let you cook. He says, hold on, let me crank up the anger machine. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, that did seem to be like the, the talking point that had been handed down, especially on the more liberal networks like CNN and MSNBC. It was like, we want to make sure none of our anchors say, yeah, if, 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 if it only been a few inches different, uh, we didn't want that. So we'll just tell them to say we're against political violence. But so, yeah, they keep repeating it. And whenever whenever the mainstream media or our government repeats the same phrase over and over again, you can pretty much know the reality is the opposite of that phrase because some marching orders have come down. Uh, another good example that Noam Chomsky pointed out before uh, his ailments, he said, you know how you know that the that the Ukraine war was, that it was provoked against Russia? It's because they keep saying it was unprovoked every <laughs> time they get a chance. They say this unprovoked, 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 unprovoked. Uh, anyway, um, but to get back to political violence, the U.S. has been the largest source of political violence by far over the past many decades. And, you know, I, I went through on my on my live stream, I went through the list, you know, uh, one list. It, it didn't have everything, but it had a lot of the assassinations or attempted assassinations or facilitated assassinations of leaders around the world that the U.S. has been involved in since the 1950s. And it is like over 40. And I'm sure that's missing many of them. But, you know, the biggest ones are, are uh, people like, uh, Salvador Allende in Chile, who they the CIA created a coup in Chile against the democratically elected socialist leader in order to pull him down. And he supposedly uh, suicided himself in the midst of that. Um, but so you, you have that. You have obviously ones we've seen in, in recent years, like uh, Gaddafi, who was over, you know, overseeing one of the most successful countries in Africa. And then he decides to go outside of the petrodollar and do a few other things the U.S. was not a fan of. Before you know it, U.S. backed a NATO invasion that completely destroyed Libya and has Gaddafi bayoneted in the streets. Um, you, you also have, of course, Saddam Hussein being executed ultimately. Uh, but then you have a lot of U.S. leaders, such as, uh, you know, JFK, and we can talk more about that if you want. But uh, you have Fred Hampton shot something like 60 times in his bed. You have MLK we already talked about. You have Malcolm X. Uh, you know, new documentaries have come out about the involvement of the NYPD. I mean, the, the man who gave Malcolm X mouth to mouth as he was laying there riddled with bullets was an NYPD undercover officer and his head of security. So that shows you how in this the NYPD and other other forces were. Um yeah, I can't even remember which ones I've said and haven't said, but Medgar Evers. Uh, it's just, it's, it's a long, long list. Uh, and RFK Jr. believes his father was killed by a CIA man. Um, 
it, the, the U.S. has just been involved in assassinations and coup attempts. Uh, there's been plots recently against Maduro, uh, Emron Khan, who we ultimately, U.S. ultimately got out of office with lawfare, which seems to be the weapon of choice nowadays for the CIA and the U.S. government. But Emron Khan was shot at one time. I, it's unclear as to whether the U.S. had any involvement in that. But they did ultimately get him in prison for many, many years where he sits right now. Um, there's, there's been attempts on Maduro, the exploding drone that was connected back to some CIA involvement that did not kill him, but uh, an attempt, the attempted invasion of Venezuela by mercenaries that Donald Trump was president during and the U S uh, somehow signed off on including Juan Guaido. You, uh, I, I mean, the, the coup attempts, so what, one of my favorite is Jean Bertrand Aristide of Haiti, the first ever democratically elected president of Haiti who we helped create a coup in Haiti to get rid of Aristide. We then put him, kidnap him, put him on a U.S. military plane, fly him to Africa and drop him off basically in the middle of Africa. It's kind of like, you know, you, you can do what you want, but you ain't going to fucking lead Haiti. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> uh, if, you, if you know what's good for you. <laughs> it's just straight up mafia attack. I think you also it, mentioned in the video, um, I've just listed 30 and that doesn't count the number of times they tried to kill Fidel Castro alone. Right? <laughs> yeah. yeah the, the, the CIA has admitted to hundreds of attempts to kill it's Fidel Castro. If you're looking for an entertaining read, you can look up some of the ways they attempted, such as a toxic lined scuba suit as a gift because they knew he was into scuba diving, an exploding seashell that they would put down where he goes scuba diving, uh, exploding cigars they tried to get to him. The, it, hundreds of attempts on Fidel Castro. Any other wily e. Coyote inventions, or was is that it? <laughs> Good Lord. Uh, yeah, those are the ones I remember. <laughs> um, I think we can also talk about the violent suppression of uprisings. I mean, you know, so again, I covered Occupy, and, uh, and I've told this story often where... Um, the first, I, I, I started covering it day three, and then I just went back in each day. And I would say that the first two weeks were some of the most magical days that I've ever been a part of. It was it was absolutely incredible. Were you, so did I meet you at Zuccotti Park? I was I was there the first I week. Didn't meet you at Zuccotti, uh, but we put two and two together when we were down in uh, D.C. Um, but I remember and got photographs because then I lost my, uh, press credentials and like, that it was because it was kind of like tossed out of the melee and everything kind of went flying, but I still have photographs of the white shirts. Now I didn't understand who these white shirts were that were coming in because they weren't from, there was remarkable unity in the first couple of weeks between the patrols, the patrolmen and the protesters. In fact, because there was such a pro-union sentiment among mm -hmm. the protesters in Zuccotti, there was actually great conversational alignment with the guys in, in the blue shirts, which was like the first time I was like, oh, that's right. This is this is a working class group as well. That's really interesting. And some, you know, I need to adjust my thinking and and stop going into things with these preconceived notions. And then the white shirts came. <laughs> And they took out their fucking billy clubs and they just started beating the shit out of people left and right and and throwing tents over and getting rid of people's possessions, locking people up, throwing them in unmarked vans. And then they took off up uptown. And I was like, whoa. So that type of political yeah. violence, the political violence that we see against any sort of political unrest or uprisings or social unrest throughout the country is met with a really heavy hand and a heavy fist as well. One of the most depressing nights of the of the Occupy suppression was uh, when, you know, I got the call that they were finally clearing the camp fully. Yeah, and, in the middle and, of the night. Yeah, in the middle of the night. And I went down there and they had us blocked like a block away so you couldn't get that close. But you could still see them, first of all, arresting anybody that would leave. But then on top of that, taking everything that had been slightly built up. I mean, nothing was a serious structure, but, you know, they had a little people's library with a lot mm -hmm. of books people had donated. And the cops were just trashing, burning, uh, throwing into dumpsters, everything that that was there, including books. And I was like, I was like, wow, this is straight up Nazi Germany <laughs> looking right here. And part of the reason they kept us a block or two away was because they didn't want 
video or good photos sure. of that stuff going on. Yeah, absolutely. So when we talk about political violence, um, it's it's always interesting that that doesn't come in again. The, the, the establishment media is just not capable of putting you know a mirror on itself, and nor nor would it, nor should it. When you think about how you procure licenses and stay on federal airwaves, and you do that, I mean, it just it's just obvious that this is how this is what's going to eventually reach the mainstream. Another idea that you've kind of blown up recently, which ama which amazes me, it's not talked about even on those liberal channels because it's not really all that controversial. It's just a little bit of math and truth telling is what's happening with the Supreme Court. So all of the hand wringing and pearl clutching over the Supreme Court and losing the majority, it's six three, and and if there's another Trump term, he could. He could get Alito and Clarence Thomas as the older members to step down and replace them with younger, even more conservative people that'll be there for the next 60 years. Like there's still a lot of hand wringing that this will codify a supermajority of the most conservative and extreme Supreme Court that we've, you know, maybe had since they handed down Dred Scott. Okay. But you came on the other day and you were like, hey, um, just hate to be the bearer of bad tidings here, Democrats. But you had your fucking chance and you blew it. So again, yeah. if you don't mind, yeah, you well, this is cook used for a as, moment. <laughs> talk for a moment. This is used as one of the main reasons to vote blue no matter who, right? It's like, well, ignore all of those things that upset you about the Democrats. Ignore the fact that Biden is currently, according to Reuters, uh, deporting more immigrants than Trump did. Ignore the fact that Biden, uh, according to even liberal sources like Vox and Huffington Post, is pumping more oil than Trump ever did, allowing more drilling on public lands than Trump ever did. Ignore all of that. Just vote blue, no matter who, because Supreme Court. They just yell it at you, right? Because Supreme Court. And that debate, that argument has been going on for years and years. And they, and now they're going, well, see, now we need to get a Democrat in there to fix the Supreme Court because it's broken. Okay, a few things. One is, uh, let's go through all the ways that the Democrats have created this far-right Supreme Court. To begin with, let's go back a few years to when Joe Biden is the one who got Clarence Thomas basically on the court. I'm not saying he voted for him, but he was running the Senate proceedings where Anita Hill was sidelined and not allowed to really speak and interrupted. And that was Biden running those hearings and, and railroading her in order to fast track Clarence Thomas on to this goddamn court. Good old Joe Biden. He's been around a while. Uh, on top of that, you have the fact that Ruth Bader Ginsburg had cancer like three times, never stepped down, was never really pressured very hard to step down, decided despite all of those cancers to, to wait it out while Obama's you know presidency ended. Well, that's a pretty easy uh, place they could have gotten another justice there. Um, you, you look at the fact that Joe Biden has had, uh, you know, some of the time has had both houses of Congress and and could have uh, it, it enlarged the Supreme Court. There's nothing in the Constitution saying it can only be nine members. That's just some random number we made up. So you could easily add more justices to the court and make it a more fair scenario so that each vote is not, you know, it's like, oh my God, is someone going to die? If you had 45 justices, no one would be <laughs> freaking out about it. <laughs> like, it'd be a lot easier scenario. Um, but then also I like to point to the fact that these justices are not as different as we're told to believe. Yes, I believe the right wing justices on that court are lunatics. But let's also look at the fact that Obama put forward Merrick Garland, who's currently uh, attorney general, put forward Merrick Gar Garland for the Supreme Court. The Republicans, uh, you know, basically filibustered it until Trump got into office and and then Merrick Garland never got on the court. Well, Merrick Garland actually maybe sat one of the greatest political gambles of all time that you have to tip your cat to Mitch McConnell because nobody <laughs> saw it coming. Nobody thought Trump was going to be president. The polling data didn't support it. That they didn't believe it. But McConnell yeah. was like, I don't know. Let's just wait. That's Let's just wait. That's just wait. like yeah. impressive. Yeah, yeah. The the turtle got his way. Mm -hmm. Um. So. Uh, uh, Merrick Garland sat on the federal bench with Brett Kavanaugh. So Brett Kavanaugh was the one who ended up taking the seat that was going to be Merrick Garland's. 
Kavanaugh and Mary Garland agreed 91% of the time. So that's the difference between these two justices, between the so-called right-wing and left-wing justices, which are both right-wing. The difference is 9%. uh, Because all of these justices, if you're going to get to the Supreme Court, and by the way, I'm coming to you as someone uh, uh, (laughs) descended from John Marshall. Uh, I'm descended from the Marshall family. Anyway, yeah, yeah. Um, Everybody else in my family has Marshall in their name, my father, my brother. Anyway. they, they, the Supreme Court, if you're going to get to that position, you have already proven throughout your career that you are a friend of the U.S. empire, a friend of capitalism, a friend of corporate America. There is no one that gets near that court that hasn't said at some level throughout their career or a large level throughout their career, I am with these mainly white male created, rich white male created laws. I support them, think they're awesome. And, you know, what we can what we can differ on is abortion rights and so, some smaller stuff. That doesn't mean it's not important. I'm, I, I believe it very much is. But I'm just saying these differences are far smaller than we've been given. And you look at abortion. It's like Joe Biden and Joe Biden, by the way, said if he's given another another term, then he'd uh, get, reinstate Roe v. Wade. And I'm like, where have you been for the past four years? You 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 you've been president. Yeah. Uh, they, you look at, you look at abortion rights. It's like the Democrats have had time throughout decades at various times where they could have, uh, consolidated, uh, codified Roe v. Wade. And they never did because they viewed it as a great reason to get votes. And so they just left it there. Uh, and, and you look at, uh, the, this latest one, which is still egregious, the idea that a president has immunity for basically anything he does in office. Now, people are freaking out, but let's think about this. All of the actually larger, very serious crimes that a president commits, such as murdering tens of thousands of children in Gaza, the endless bombs raining down on innocent people, et cetera, et cetera, the environmental destruction, all of that, they had immunity to before this ruling. There no charges were ever going to be brought against a president for the actual crimes these sociopaths commit on a daily basis. Instead, what they now have is further immunity to, you know, take home classified documents or whatever. So to me, it was just a little icing on the cake of immunity that is the U.S. presidency. I'm, I'm guessing that, to your point, now they can murder people with their own hands. Yeah, because, I guess the, like, the, difference your, would be, like, the difference would be the difference. What else is there, right? Yes. Oh, I did this. Yeah. The, the, the difference would be, I guess, Trump could shoot someone in the Oval Office now. <laughs> right. So, you know, it's interesting because I I try not, I steer clear of, um, well, first of all, Marshall is like the most consequential justice that ever lived. Can we just talk about that for a second? That's like yeah, fucking amazing I, you're related to him. Yeah, I, I thought because he's so consequen- consequential, I thought he was the first chief justice, but he was the fourth, I believe. So um, I try to steer clear of SCOTUS decisions specifically. So, you know, most of what we do here is socioeconomic. Because whenever I read these decisions, I could read a conservative justice opinion and be like, oh, I guess that makes sense. You know, when you just read it uh, on the the merits of the case law that they're looking at and the things that they're yeah. considering. And I, I don't I, I don't get it. Legal language. There's a reason I think you go to law school and that we have hundreds of years of precedence and there's different angles and things. And there's a reason you have a court system is because shit isn't easy. Nothing's black and white. And then you get human intervention on all this stuff. Um, so I try not to go, I, I try not to get over my skis when I'm talking about the Supreme court and the ramifications of certain decisions, unless it's something that I know cold, like I knew well, and, Holland and Brackeen cold yeah. because we do native issues here, but the and rest they, of this stuff is out, tricky. They, well, in a lot of them, they throw out because they say they didn't have cause. So that's a little different than, you know, like, like everyone was reporting that the Supreme court ruled you could keep having the abortion pills. Well, technically, kind of, but really, they just they just, just didn't take it up. The people, well, no, they did take it up. They just ruled they didn't have cause, right? I thought that anyway. they didn't have standing in it. Is that standing, what it was? Sorry. St- standing, yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, I didn't. I don't know if they didn't take it up or they ruled on standing, whatever it was. But again, yeah. so what? Sometimes when they decide to take something, it's 
you could say that that is you know judicial intervention when they decide not to take something it could be the same thing yeah um i find it fascinating to see what they choose to take what they don't take and then sometimes when they kick it back when they say we're not taking this and we kick it back to let the decision stand at the highest level before the supreme court that is a way of making a de facto decision as well so it gets really complicated to try and like discern right. these things so i i feel like though that KBJ, and, and I've said before that I feel like in retrospect, that will actually be Biden's crowning achievement, that in the order of the justices now, that she's certainly what we would consider the most liberal. She's definitely, by orders of magnitude, the most qualified person that sat on the bench, maybe mm -hmm. since your great, 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 great grandpappy, <laughs> um, and will be is young enough to have an enduring and lasting impact and maybe see the whole thing kind of uh switch over because she has dissented against the liberal colleagues early on in some really fascinating cases but mm. i find it all very very complex and above my pay grade because of they see things that we don't and i'm not i'm not apologizing for for them i just i'm not a lawyer and i don't get it okay, okay well yeah on the and that in that regard, you and I share that. Uh, can I just throw in here also, I, I forgot to even say that uh, the Supreme Court is a ridiculously stupid, undemocratic, antiquated uh, system. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Okay, thank you. Yes, <laughs> closing arguments heard. I mean, uh, you know, when they when they first wrote in that the Supreme Court justices uh, have a lifetime appointment, the average dude lived to like, you know, 51 if he was lucky. Like if you lived to 39, they made you mayor. It like it just was a it was a different world. Now they're living to 112 and they're they, they, you know, gotta decide their their opinion by what drooled out of his mouth that day. It's just <laughs> a completely different world. It's just the lifetime appointment thing is insane. I was trying to look up yesterday. I was trying to look up. Uh, somebody had questioned me about like the inexperienced ticket on the Trump side, like putting Vance in there. He's got two years experience. Trump had zero before being president. Like we're just not bringing professionals in. And so I was going through like the history of what experience was on uh, vice presidents, uh, you know, other like presidents, vice presidents and other, you know, heads of state. And back to your point, like if you go far enough back and you go like into the 1800s, you see that these guys like had seven years of experience. And in that time was a lieutenant governor, a governor, a senator, the assistant secretary to the Navy, vice president, and that president. You're like, Jesus, because they had to jam a lot of shit in because they all died very, very young. All that experience came by 25. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so let's talk about uh, a travesty. Uh, there's something I wanted to bring up because you were on the front lines of this, I feel like from like day one. And um, if I'm not mistaken, even became uh, close with the family. Um, talking about Julian Assange. I want to make sure that this doesn't just become been there, done that old news. Because mm -hmm. there's the personal plight of Julian. And then there is what then there is just being beaten by the state. So a lot of people were character, again, mainstream media characterizing this as a victory for the Assange family and the United States. Everybody sort of, like, oh, everybody wound up okay here. And, and shoo, shoo, we, we really dodged that bullet because people were mad about that. And then, and it's like almost that same directive we were talking about before. Now everybody stopped talking about it immediately. It was in the news and then it was gone, right? Yeah. He's in Australia now, bye. But, the long tail, the chilling of speech, of journalism, and the long tail that this case actually demonstrates is frightening. So if you could just give us a little bit about your advocacy for Assange over the years, how you kind of became really close to that specific issue, um, and then your fears related to how it all actually wound up uh, going down. Yeah, well, how it started was, you know, way back in those Occupy days, WikiLeaks was just so important and pivotal and revolutionary. And and I always try and remind everybody, because this is this is something that's not even talked about often by those who support Julian, that WikiLeaks was into transparency of governments around the world. WikiLeaks was not just U.S.-centric 
uh, releases. They revealed uh, massive scandals and corruption and criminality uh, by the, the British government, the Australian government, Russia, China, Peru, uh, Syria. It, I mean, the list goes on and on. Uh, and about big banks, about uh, corporations. Um, so it, it's just, it was a, a revolutionary invention, WikiLeaks was. And, you know, maybe one day we'll have something similar again. But, uh, and I became a fan, you know, I was like, this is changing the world. It is, it, it sparked off, you know, the Arab Spring, even though much of that didn't end the way people would want it, but it still uh, had this huge impact. It sparked, uh, I think it was a big spark behind Occupy. And anyway, so when the government started going after Julian Assange, I just knew from day one, it was like, they are desperate to shut up people learning about what it is they're doing, about the reality of how our U.S. government operates. Uh, you know, whether it's gunning down innocent civilians with the collateral murder video, but, uh, you know, I think perhaps the more important stuff is all these State Department cables showing the tit for tat, the corruption, the trying of uh, you know, the, the, the manufacturing of, of various governments to bend to the U.S. will, et cetera. And they just did everything they could to attack each, I mean, I have, it's very clear there were meetings at the highest level on how to attack WikiLeaks. And step one was to chop off the head of the leader, Assange. Step two was to go after the money, which they got PayPal to ban them, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you know, step three was to go after each of the members of the board of, you know, at WikiLeaks. Like, it was just such a clear uh, operation to dismantle and destroy WikiLeaks. And then the kind of the only thing that remained for the past many years has been the ongoing torture of Julian Assange. And you, you, I have I have interviewed uh, several members of his family, Stella, uh, his wife, and uh, several interviews with his father, John Shipton. Um, and, you know, that's that's where my my advocacy for Assange came from. I view what he did as revolutionary. Uh, he was and is a journalist. And he was revealing the truth about our world. And I also always like to point out that WikiLeaks never once published something false, not a false sentence. Compare that to even just what the New York Times or CNN or Washington Post have admitted they've gotten wrong. Even just their retractions are about every half hour. So uh, it's it, it's just amazing uh, what he was able to achieve, what they were able to achieve with WikiLeaks. and. So then, you know, we fight for him and fight for him and fight for him and try and keep him in the news. And I do believe that it was the fight of of so many people to keep this in the news that actually uh, ultimately scored his freedom. But it, it does seem clear now that perhaps the rush for a plea deal uh, had to do with the fact that the apparently his next I know it's, it's such a kangaroo court in Britain that it's tough to even consider this stuff, but. The, the next uh, chance he was going to get to appeal, he'd actually get to bring in um, evidence of, of his right to free speech and his uh, right to journalism and things like that. And the U.S. apparently was afraid they could actually lose the next round. And if they were to lose it, he would be free and they would have nothing on paper saying he'd ever been guilty of anything. So I think they were like, well, we've basically destroyed him. If we can just get this plea deal, then we can say to the world, you publish our secrets and we we legally now can come after you. We have a precedent now that we are allowed to come after anybody in the world who publishes our secrets. Um, and that is the scary part of it. I don't fault Julian at all for taking that plea deal because, uh, you know, his life has been destroyed enough. He was being tortured and destroyed 23 hours in solitary confinement every day for, you know, 12 years, if you count the embassy. And, and, you know, that's enough. I, I would say take whatever it is to, to get, to uh, gain your freedom. Um, so I, I am not surprised he signed this, but this is the U S government saying, you know, we control the world. The world is mm -hmm. responsible to our laws and we can go after and torture someone who was never in the U S was never an American citizen, did not operate from the U S has no connection to the America. And you're now accountable to us. Um, we don't have a lot of time left because you have a very busy media schedule coming up. Um, so I just want to hit a couple of quick things before we go. 
All right, this it's, is the speed, the speed round. Speed round. I actually don't consider you a political commentator because I think that that would be uh, a little reductive. So, um, because I think that a lot of the work that you've done over the years is just, uh, it, it's just exposing. It's uh, their exposés. This is how things really work. Your your your, uh, your ability to kind of deconstruct things, but also do it with humor and 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 that and the like. Having said that, it is in the political milieu, and I'm curious what you think. Um, if, if Biden stays in the race, what you think the plurality will look like come the fall? Um, or do you think that they're setting up Kamala to, to run? And also, what do you think the plurality will look like in the fall? I mean, I'd, I'd say if Biden stays in, then, and it's seeming less and less likely, even the bigger Democrats apparently are turning on him, Pelosi and, uh, Adam, Adam Schiff and these, these horrible parasitic human beings, even they're turning on uh, Joe Biden. But uh, if he were to stay in, it'd be a landslide for Trump. It may be a landslide for Trump, even if Biden is replaced. Uh, I know they're saying that he that the DNC seems to think it's not very easy to replace him with anyone other than Kamala Harris, because apparently by their bylaws, I guess the money that Biden has raised would go to her if he were to step down or become incapacitated or something. So it seems to be that that would be their easiest option is just to go to Kamala Harris. But, uh, uh, you know, her, her polling is not, is not very good. Like, I don't think she's, and she's never, the other thing is like, it's not just polling. She's never shown herself capable of really grabbing people uh, when she was running in the primaries, she was not doing well. She just does not grab people as uh, as someone who's uh, gonna gonna lead a lot of change in this country, and that's what people want. You know, whether they're on the right or left, they want change because it is uh, th this this system is crushing people. Now, I will also throw in here that as with the Supreme Court decision, maybe people are tired of hearing this. As with the Supreme Court decisions, I think. This decision between Biden and Trump is less uh, significant than a lot of people say. It doesn't mean it's not important, but uh, I think that a lot of the U.S. machinery in terms of the uh, in military industrial complex, in terms of how capitalism functions, in terms of the greed and uh, and extraction mechanisms of the big banks and the big oil companies, everything, all of that pretty much runs uh, the same, uh, whether you have Biden or Trump in that office. Uh, like I said, Biden has done more fossil fuels and drilling than Trump did. Just to give one example, um, you the, 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 the bigger kind of owners of this system, they, they fund both sides. Uh, you know, one of the biggest examples is uh, the most power, perhaps the most powerful entity in the world, BlackRock has, you know, $10 trillion of assets. They are the, one of the top shareholders of 88% of the top 500 corporations and companies in the United States. And they uh, are part and parcel to the Biden administration. There are several former BlackRock people in the Biden administration. Uh, they help fund campaigns and things like that. But they're just, you know, they, they are part of the Biden administration. Mr. So, Camp, with all due respect, I mean, Blackstone does have environmental, sustainable and governance funds that invest in really <laughs> forward thinking companies like Tesla and Alphabet and Face. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wait. And Google, okay. yeah. I'm exactly. sorry. Continue. Yeah. Great point. Although your slip up there actually makes my neck point. You said Blackstone. I was talking about BlackRock, but. Oh, BlackRock. Black That's what I meant. Larry Fink and BlackRock. Larry yeah. Fink, BlackRock. Yes. But the biggest funder, one of the biggest funders of Donald Trump uh, is the CEO of Blackstone, a That's separate right. entity. But get that that is the largest landlord in America and is buying up all of our houses. But guess who the top shareholder is of Blackstone? BlackRock. <laughs> so it is one massive circle jerk. And when you are the one of the top, you know, three shareholders of 88 percent of the biggest companies in America, none of those companies are going to do anything to alienate you because you are one of their biggest shareholders. So that means essentially every large decision made by 88 percent of all companies across America is approved or decided, but let's just say approved, let's be nice, approved by BlackRock uh, and Vanguard and State Street. So th this is, and you know, uh, uh, this goes back to 
Sheldon Wolin and the inverted totalitarianism. These are the people controlling the show. They'll make sure that, as Biden said to his investors uh, or whatever donors, he said, nothing will fundamentally change. Um, so it's not that I don't believe Trump is a, a maniac. It's just I get less excited about that than creating, you know, large scale on the ground uh, civil disobedience and and community change that can spiral into something much larger. So next quick question before we wrap up is where do you consider yourself on the political spectrum? Because I've heard over the years, I would say threads of the good part of libertarianism, certainly a, a large strain of being a so-called leftist, um, maybe even leaning uh, some ways further to uh, democratic socialism, uh, but you're a curious bird. You're actually hard to pin down. Uh, and, and I don't know that you want to be pinned down. You could just be a humanist, but where do you consider yourself in the spectrum? Yeah, man, I'm just a, a peace and love man, you know? <laughs> uh, I mean, part of, part of the, part of it probably has to do with the fact that I don't, I don't really feel the need to pin myself down. I, uh, I have never defined myself as an ist, mm -hmm. uh, but I, I largely go issue to issue, but I'd say that if you look at my issue to issue stances, uh, you know, over 90% or something are going to align with, uh, you know, Cornell West and Claudia De La Cruz and Jill Stein, uh, who have some differences, but not many. So they seem to yeah. be more personal than professional. Yeah, I, I guess uh, le left, left of the spectrum, but I, uh, I just, I think our system, it, it all comes down to systems and our systems are designed to uh, extract and ri enrich, uh, extract the world and enrich a tiny number of individuals. And you break those systems, then you can create a better sustainable world based on equality. And I kind of just come at everything from that angle without, uh, I mean, maybe it's to my benefit. You know, I'm I'm actually not that educated on like Marx and things like that. But, uh, you know, maybe that allows me to not uh, to not lose people when I'm talking about these issues um, and and kind of just come at it from a, a fairly simple point of view. But it, it certainly is not the point of view that is the most popular right now because so many people take in the propaganda of our corporate airwaves. All right. Last question, Lee Camp. Um, how have you, or have you ever been approached to pick a side that would be uh, in your financial best interest? And the reason I'm asking that is because I've seen some people who have, um, let's just say, uh, maybe it's a, a an Alex Jones or a Russell Brand that sort of you know flew cl too close to the sun uh, <laughs> and just got too far out there. But then you've got you've got people like you know the 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 Charlie Kirks or the Gavin McGinnises of the world or the people that have just been like okay this is really financially beneficial I'm going here but likewise I've also seen some networks that have tilted that way tilted from the left into the more quote you know mainstream liberal because the funding is just better more available um, and has that ever has has anybody ever approached you to sort of like sit you down and be like listen man you know great presentation you're really capable on camera you look good you're 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 smart you're really well connected if you could just like veer this way or that way it'd be a little more lucrative have you ever had the mafia conversation i never have i think they just decided i'm not worth it or something i don't know um I never have. I if someone said, you know, change your change what you're talking about and we'll give you this big contract, I wouldn't do that. Uh, certainly not. But I also don't deny that we live within capitalism. I mean, it's it, if you're a a fish trying to lead a revolution onto land, you can't deny you're in the water. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you, can't, you can't go. I what water? Uh, so I, you know, I. It, it, there's some things that annoy me about about this system. I mean, for, you know, right now, like because I, uh, it, it's very difficult to even fund my show because the, of the suppression on YouTube and everything. Uh, so for the first time in my career, I'm like, well, if I could find a spoken ad that actually aligned with my interests, I wouldn't be that opposed to it. It hasn't happened yet, but. Um, and I, you know, it's, it's the kind of thing I'm not dying to do, but 
I don't, I understand that life can get there where it's like, uh, you know, okay. So for 30 seconds, I say, Hey, check out this, uh, this scented candle. And then I'm able to keep having a show. It's like, maybe I'll do that. But, but no, you know, to answer your question, if it were a large change, if it were like, if it were like, Hey, stop talking about big oil and, uh, we'll let you, we'll, we'll throw you money. Uh, no, I would never do that. Um, and I've never been asked to, uh, but I did, you know, I did learn that, like, for example, I, I guess there's multiple times where I've lost things, whether directly or indirectly, because, uh, I did not kind of subtly move to what I knew they wanted. An example would be, uh, I was a comedy writer for Huffington Post. This is back in the time when comedy, when Huffington Post actually had a comedy page, um, and a comedy staff. And I was a part-time writer and I'd come in and do pieces for them. Uh, then they realized that they could fire the comedy staff and just repost other people's comedy and then not have to pay anyone. So they started doing that. I still would occasionally write things for them just because I wanted a big audience. So I do some unpaid, but they then for the first time ever uh, refused to post one of my things. And it was when I called Donald Rumsfeld a war criminal. And I emailed them and I said, are you guys not posting this? Cause I called Donald Rumsfeld a war criminal. And they said, they wrote back and said, yeah, it's kind of not really our tone. And I easily could have been like, sure, take it out. No problem. Or right. I, I could have done another one that was lighter. Uh, and I just never worked with them again because I was like, if we can't call Donald Rumsfeld a war, war criminal. Then what are we doing? What are we doing here? Yeah. Um, so, and, and, you know, I also knew as I was coming up as a comedian, I didn't know it at first, but I learned it, that if I were to back off a lot of these issues in my stand-up act, then I could have more chances on Comedy Central or get a spot on Jimmy Kimmel or whatever it was. And I never did it. So, uh, well, you gave a lot of us moments of clarity. I will tell you Thanks. that. And that's why I wanted to start with that too. Um, and, and bookend the conversation with that because, um, obviously the answer was obvious, at least from, from my side. And I, I think it's funny that you were even as considerate and it, 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 when you were answering it, uh, that you are as principled and and as straightforward, I think, as a human can be. And your work, you know, shows that over the years. Um, and those moments of clarity that you that you gave, especially during that time of, of again, political sentience, where a lot of us were looking at things and being like, this doesn't feel right, mm -hmm. right at the time where we had new avenues to learn. That that was a really energizing moment in time that like my kids can't appreciate as an example like they're never gonna they're never gonna they don't have the before and the after and then yeah. the before again which is kind of what we live through which is like everything is stifled everything is prepackaged. that i only get fed what they tell me to oh my god everything just opened up in an instant this is unbelievable and i just learned everything about it to where we are again which is oh nope let's close all that shit back down and you'll just get what we feed you um, that yep. trajectory is very specific to a block, to a generation or maybe two generations of people that kind of got to feel both sides of that. And I find that interesting. And what's super cool is that you were you and then you stayed you and you're still you throughout the whole thing. <laughs> so um, it's Thank it's you. flowers for me and a way to just, uh, you know, give you my respect the way that people can find you and not the shit that's been removed or censored i've got um well i've got the lee camp show the common censored podcast and the government secrets podcast <laughs> but then there's america inc on the breakthrough news youtube channel um which is great by the way well done oh thank you um, yeah we've got i think we've got four episodes up so far yeah, yeah. And your personal YouTube, Dangerous Ideas with Lee Camp. Are there any other places that we can send people? Yeah, I appreciate that. It is a lot of weird uh, shows and things. Part of it is due to the fact that my my podcast was called Moment of Clarity for years. And then they banned it on Spotify without a reason or right to appeal or anything. Um, and then I recreated it under a new name. So it's multiple names, but Moment of Clarity and The Lee Camp Show, depending on your platform, are my main podcast. Uh, I live stream four days a week at youtube.com slash moment of clarity. Uh, it's now called Dangerous Ideas, but that's the YouTube channel. And for people that cannot remember, I have books too, but for people who cannot remember all this, it's all in my link tree. So linktree.com slash Lee Camp. Perfect. 
Thank you for your time today. There's a lot of good stuff that's uh, a lot of good stuff. There's, I'm sorry, let me reposition that. There's a lot of really horrifying shit that's about to happen to the country. <laughs> so at some point, I'd love to have you back on to work through some of them. And thanks for your Mag, time. I'd love to come back anytime. It's a pleasure to talk to you. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks so much.